You are listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truth in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. The scripture says in Genesis 39 2, and you can read it in the passage in front of you, it says this, second verse of Genesis 39, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. God's blessing on Joseph's life, coupled with Joseph's personal integrity, and he was a man of integrity, led to his being promoted to a place of prominence in the household of Potiphar. And eventually, Joseph gained Potiphar's complete and undeserved trust. And we read that in the fifth and the sixth verse of the passage. Follow along. From the time that he put him in charge of his household... And of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. And the writer of Genesis, as he writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, finishes this brief narrative of Joseph's professional life with a personal aside. And we read that in the latter part of the sixth verse that says this, Now Joseph was well built and handsome. We would say he was some good looking dude. We would say that he was uh, tall, dark and handsome. And this brings us to the sensual temptation that this good-looking, well-built, handsome man faced. You see, while Mr. Potiphar is appreciating Joseph's reliable uh, business sense and trustworthy nature, can I say to you that Mrs. Potiphar is becoming increasingly preoccupied with Joseph's good build and Joseph's good looks. And we read in the seventh verse, and after a while he, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Park your sandals under my bed. I mean, you'd say that was the pretty direct approach, wouldn't you? And Joseph immediately, this great man of God who was upright and full of integrity, immediately but politely he refuses. And he tries, first of all, to appeal to her reason, and then secondly he appeals to her conscience. Look at that, verses 8 and 9. Follow along. (coughs) Excuse me. And it says here, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? But you see, Mrs. Potiphar isn't moved a bit. She's not moved one single solitary iota. She isn't interested in the sanctity of her marriage or the the trust between her husband and Joseph that has been built up. She's interested only in gratifying her physical lust. Now, nothing else. Come to bed with me now, Joseph. It's no wonder then that Joseph's spiritual concern also fell on what I would call a careless heart. 
Now, this would be a good time for us as we're developing this because we're following on from this morning. And I told you in this series of messages, we would do the passage in, in James. And then on Sunday nights, we would take a character in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament and develop the, a situation that fits the passage that we looked at in the morning. So this would be a good place for us to pause just for a moment to clarify some of the specifics in Joseph's situation. First of all, Joseph faced what I would call a very difficult dilemma. The very place where in which he worked, the very place where in which he lived, Potiphar's household, brought him face to face with one almighty, very seductive temptation. And the temptation was named Mrs. Potiphar. Secondly, the advances that she was making surely must have flattered Joseph's ego and aroused his lust. You know, uh, it's very difficult to uh, resist a woman who comes at you and sort of uh, uh, gives you uh, the eye and sort of uh, says you're tall and you're dark and you're handsome and uh, let alone say come to bed with me. Very difficult to resist that. In fact, many men in leadership have failed because they have succumbed to that offer. And Joseph uh, undoubtedly was, it must have flattered his ego and it must have aroused his interest at least or even aroused his lust to some degree. Thirdly, the source of temptation was, now listen to this, was persistent. She, she pursued him day after day. And you say to me, Pastor Ross, how do you know that? Well, I'm glad you asked me because it's right in the text. I don't have to work it out. Look what it says, verse 10. And though she spoke to J Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. Fourthly, the woman pursued Joseph when they were alone. when there wouldn't be any uh, fear of detection. It seems, it seems like a, a Peyton Place novel, doesn't it? Things haven't changed since Old Testament times. And look what it says in verse 11. She, she pursued him when they, uh, when they were alone. Look what it says, verse 11. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. It was a vulnerable time for Joseph. Undoubtedly, I would suggest to you, uh, uh, knowing what uh, some of these things are like, uh, undoubtedly his lust was working overtime uh, uh, on his will and uh, pressuring him to give in. You know, that's what happens when we come, when we face temptation. There is the pressure that comes. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's business or anything like that or whether it's sensual. There is always the pressure that comes. Uh, always the pressure that comes. And in Joseph's case, you can almost imagine... Uh, what was going through his mind, uh, nobody's going to know. Her husband's gone. The servants aren't around. The place is empty. She's willing. So what's it going to hurt? It's done all the time. It's part of the culture in which I live. The final test for Joseph came. When Potiphar's wife resorted to more than just words to lure him, to lie with her. See what it says there in the 12th verse of the passage? Just go to the 12th verse in, in uh, chapter 39. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. Now listen now. Every time the, the issue of sexual lust is dealt with in the New Testament, we're told to flee, to get up and run. 
That brings to mind a situation that happened to me in Altoona, Pennsylvania 40 years ago. In those days, my hair was not gray. My hair was, uh, was uh, dark and I was probably around about uh, 20 or 30 pounds lighter than I am today. I hadn't got the bulges that I've got now because I've uh, been satisfied and fed well and all of that type of stuff. But I uh, preached a message there and uh, uh, I had been away from home from my wonderful wife and uh, we had all, always covenanted to be faithful to one another. and. Uh, and I uh, got cop, uh, stepped out of the pulpit and one of the ladies came up to me and she was a good looking girl and she said, I suppose you're a little bit lonely. Very innocently I said, oh yeah, I've been away from home for a couple of months. She said, I can fix that for you. I want to tell you right now, I, that Joseph uh, illustration in Genesis 39 came in and I just dropped everything and headed out of that church at 100 mile an hour. The Old Testament, uh, the New Testament rather, you know, every time it comes up, we're told to flee, to get up and run. And some things we're to stand and some things we're to resist. There's no doubt about this. But when it comes to sensual lust, we're told to do exactly what Joseph did. Get out of there. You may think this is funny. But if I'm up at a hospital or in an office block and uh, there's just... Uh, and the lift comes up and there's nobody uh, uh, in the lift uh, other than, say, myself and the woman that's going to help in. I refuse to get I don't go into the lift. Uh, I know you might think that's a little bit paranoid, but I've uh, got too much to lose uh, in this ministry. <clears throat> and if we stay, we may... Give in. And this brings us to the personal ramification. Someone once said, Heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. All the lust that had burned in Potiphar's wife suddenly blazed into fury. And what she wanted was she wanted revenge for her rejection. And in the 16th verse of this passage, this wonderful passage of scripture that is so clear, the 16th verse says, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. And then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you bought us came to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph master, Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, I want to tell you, as you study this passage of scripture, there's no doubt about it, Joseph did the right thing. He did what was right before God, but once he got outside, he didn't hear angels singing his praises for saying no. The choirs of heaven weren't saying, oh, you did a great job, Joseph. No, what he heard instead was the scream of a woman. A woman that would hurl him from the heights of Potiphar's overseer in charge of the household of Potiphar to the depths of an obscure jail prison cell. But he did the right thing. Now listen carefully. Even though Joseph was imprisoned as a common criminal, you know what? In the eyes of the Lord, he was faithful. He did the right thing. And we read that in uh, verses uh, uh, 21 and uh, 23. He was considered in the eyes of the Lord to be a faithful servant. Look at verse 21 of the passage in front of us here. It says this, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness 
and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison water. It's what you call grace. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. All this brings me to some practical applications for today. So here are four important observations to help you in your struggle to say no when your desire says yes. Wherever the temptation may be. Firstly, you must not be weakened by your situation. You must not be weakened by your situation. You see, several aspects of Joseph's position could have undercut his resolve to say no to, his, to, to desire or to lust. He enjoyed a secure, high-paying job with the potential for advancement. His personality and his uh, accomplishment uh, made him the object of praise. And perhaps most dangerously of all, he had complete autonomy. He was accountable to no one. And let me tell you, those things combined make it very easy to sin. Secondly, you must not be deceived by persuasion. You must not be per, per deceived by persuasion. You see, Mrs. Potiphar was bold and flattering and calculating and her proposition was tantalizing. And I would suggest to you that no doubt that her verbal enticements were as loosely clad and suggestive as she must have been herself. And we'll never know exactly what those persuasive words were, but here are a few we might hear in our society today. Your wife doesn't love you like she should. By doing this, you'll prove that you really, you really love me. Who will ever find out? We're perfectly safe. And look, we're going to be married in a few months. What does it matter? Thirdly, you must not be gentle with your emotions. You must not be gentle with your emotions. F.B. Meyer, great old Baptist pastor, said, and I quote, resist the first tiny rill of temptation lest it widen a breach big enough to admit the ocean. Remember that nothing can master you unless you admit it within. And as the blood purchased children of the living God, we must absolutely refuse to entertain Desires that are outside of the will of God, whether they be lustful or otherwise. Even for a single solitary moment, our resolve must be as firm as Joseph. For a single solitary moment, we should not succumb to those things. Fourthly, you must not be confused by the immediate results. You must not be confused by the immediate results. You see, don't be surprised when your Mrs. Potiphar keeps coming back to tempt you after you've said no. 
saying not a temptation, whatever kind it may be, listen to me carefully, doesn't banish it forever. You see, lust and desire doesn't give up that easily. Be prepared to have to say no again the very next day or even the very next minute. Okay. Our time is ticking away and we don't want to keep you all night. If I got three or four amens, I might preach myself to death and you'd all say hallelujah. <laughs> but let me give you a final thought. Even with all of these helpful insights, many of us are still going to give in to our desires or give in to our lusts, whatever you want to, whatever it comes your way. And that's because of one basic problem. Jerry Bridges, in his, the author of The Pursuit of Holiness, discovered this problem, this one basic problem, while studying 1 John which was saying in effect, make it, and, and I quote, make it your aim not to sin. And he said, as I thought about this, I realized that deep within my heart, my real aim was not to sin very much. Can you imagine, he says, a soldier going into battle with the aim of not getting hit very much? We can be sure if that is our aim, we will be hit, not with bullets, but with temptation over and over again. You see, Joseph, this man of God, had a commitment not to sin. We saw that clearly in the 39th chapter, verses 9 and 10. The battle of saying no to lust is really won or lost, listen to me, in our attitude towards sin. So before you go into the spiritual battlefield tomorrow, do two things. First, be sure to equip yourself with the helpful insights we glean from Joseph's story. And secondly, ask yourself this question. Is my battle plan not to sin very much or not to sin at all? The excellent Bible expositor Donald Gray Barnhouse in his work on Genesis points out, and I quote this in closing, Eve sinned by listening to the enemy long before she took the fruit. Victory is won in the citadel of the mind far, far from the overt act of sin. Sin is so fascinating that it bewitches those who listen for even a moment. As a man cannot take fire into his bosom without being burned, in terms of Proverbs 6.27, neither can he harbour sin in his heart without being corrupted. If Achan had turned from the bar of gold as soon as he felt the desire for it springing up in his heart, if David had turned away his eyes the instant he saw Bathsheba, how much shame and misery would have been avoided. Amen, amen. and amen. Thank you for tuning in with Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org Until next time, God bless.